Hi, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming to our event on, event on legal aspects of relief operations. Um, and and um, my name is Edo Rosenzweig. I think I've been in touch with personally each and every one of you towards the workshop. And first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. And I know it's been a long ride for some of you. And um, we're going to make that first evening easy going and, and um, nice and tasty. And we have a great keynote uh, presentation later on. Uh, I think we're going to start with a few introductory words from uh, each organization taking part of this uh, um, workshop. So we're going to start with Professor Elisato Salzberger from the Minerva Center for Rule of Law and Direction Conditions at the University of Haifa. And after that, we're going to have Pina uh, Shavit Baruch from the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. And after that, we're going to have Einav Levy from the Israel School of Humanitarian Action. Um, so let's start with Eli. Thank you very much, Idol. It's not really an introductory remarks, but really a welcome. So it's really a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to the city of Haifa, downtown Haifa, to the University of Haifa, to the law faculty, to the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law under Extreme Conditions. Um, I don't know uh, for how many of you this is uh, first visit in Israel. Um, maybe some, maybe more people uh, for more people, it's the first visit of Haifa. Israel is a very, very tiny country, but regions in Israel and cities in Israel differ very much from each other. And we are proud, I'm originally from Jerusalem, a refugee from Jerusalem, I call myself, and Haifa is the city of coexistence, the city of coexistence between different communities, Arab and Jews, as you will see downtown here is flourishing. Uh, religious and secular. Uh, Haifa in many ways is the past city of Palestine. It had its great uh, standing before the establishment of the State of Israel. It was the hub, commercial hub and uh, uh, industrial hub of Palestine. Borders were open. It's just an hour and an hour and drive from here to Beirut, an hour and quarter from here to Damascus. You can imagine that. Um, and when Israel was established, Haifa became a periphery. So we say Haifa is the city of the past and the city of the future because it is the model for future Israel. It's not Jerusalem, which is Middle Eastern. It's not Tel Aviv, which is a global city. It is a real Mediterranean city. And I hope that you'll have some time uh, to enjoy the cultural spirit of Haifa. As the city of Haifa, the University of Haifa is uh, the most uh, heterogeneous university in Israel. We have about 30-35% uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian students, and it's really a mirror or, of Israeli society. And when we, you know Europeans ask us how Israel can be a model for us. This is, for example, higher education and the integration of various uh, groups into higher education in Israel uh, in Haifa is a, a real example. Uh, so I hope that you'll have a chance to have a short experience tomorrow at the main campus of the University of Haifa, from which you can actually see on a clear day the fighting in Syria. Uh, the University of Haifa is now making a big transformation, shifting half of its campus to the town. So if you have time after dinner to walk around the port area, uh, you see uh, also the university is present and the spirit of Haifa. The law faculty of the University of Haifa was established uh, some 25 years ago. It's the youngest law faculty, not including the colleges of law. And in a sense, it revolutionized legal education in Israel. Until then, legal education in Israel was very formalist, uh, continental or old English style. 
And, and when we were open, our founding fathers thought that law cannot be taught only on the basis of the books. It has to take a real uh, legal realism seriously to explore how law operates on the ground. Uh, we were the first, for example, to open clinical programs uh, in Haifa. Uh, and for example, one of our current clinical problems, uh, programs operate a legal clinic in Lesbos uh, to help uh, some of the Syrian refugees, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I hope that you'll have a chance tomorrow maybe also to visit the law faculty. It's really a hub of a very, very interesting cutting edge uh, academic uh, uh, scholarship as well as real uh, action on uh, the ground. The Minerva Center for the Rule of Law Under Extreme Condition, which is co-hosting this fantastic workshop, uh, was established uh, seven years ago after winning a competition of the Minerva Foundation, which is an offspring of the Max Planck uh, Foundation. And this is a center which uh, that conduct research on the rule of law under extreme condition. And when we established the center, uh, the idea was to examine what should and how is the rule of law affected by various types of extreme conditions, whether it's, whether it's natural or man-made disaster, wars, belligerencies, and even social and economic meltdowns. Um, in extreme conditions, we have this uh, inherent conflict between the need to mitigate the extreme condition, to try to get the state or the entity outside of uh, back to normality, which requires more powers to the government to rescue services and others. Uh, and extreme conditions are exactly the time in which people are most vulnerable. Uh, human rights violations, etc. And this is uh, the bread and butter of our work at the Minerva Center. Um, and recently, we actually thought about the fact that the rule of law is becoming under extreme conditions without extreme conditions. So this is <laughs> basically kind of an extension of what we do. and. Uh, if you see the political situation in Israel, this is very much uh, towards extreme conditions. We are in uh, a very, very intensive attempt to um, block some of the reforms that are proposed by the government to be established in Israel, uh, which uh, mean uh, the reforms are meant to uh, lower uh, or actually uh, destroy the very, very impressive public legal institutions that were built in Israel over the 70 last years, uh, public legal institutions which exactly uh, protect minorities and individuals, especially or also in times of emergency, by the way, in difference to many other countries in which in times of extreme condition or emergencies, the court don't want to intervene. This was not the tradition in Israel, and therefore the attempts of the government to, uh, uh, to curtail uh, and to change the public legal institution structure and independence is, is very worrying, and I think this is our uh, constitutive moment of defending liberal democracy in Israel. Uh, so this is the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law Under Extreme Conditions, and it's not only a real pleasure to welcome you, it's really an honor because we sit, you know, in the University Ivory Tower, and we'll see what I mean tower tomorrow, and we conduct studies, research, read, write, but you, most of you, are doing uh, the real work on the ground uh, in various relief operations. And I think this cooperation of the academia uh, with the field is very much in the tradition of the University of Haifa Faculty of Law, in tradition of the Minerva Center. And it's really a great thing that we uh, managed to organize this workshop. Ido 
credits really goes to you and also to uh, Michal Bengal, the director of the Minerva uh, Center um, for all her uh, fantastic work. Um, and I really hope that this is just a beginning of a new relationship and not only that we academics learn from you, uh, but that you will be interested also to come to us and conduct academic research uh, within our uh, modest, um, um, modest uh, institution. I want to thank uh, our partners to this event, um, the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, especially the president of the organization, uh, Advocate Mayor uh, Lutzen, uh, the President, Colonel Pnina Sharvit Baruch, and the CEO, uh, Ronit Gidron Tzemach. And it's a great pleasure also to uh, thank the Israeli School of Humanitarian Action and its founding director, Einav Levy, for all uh, together making this workshop happen. And uh, I wish you a very, very successful deliberation. Um, good evening. So good evening, and I'm Pnina uh, Sharvit Baruch. I'm the vice president of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, and we are called the IAJLJ. As you can see, it's not very easy to say IAJLJ, so I will refer to us as the association. <laughs> Uh, the association uh, is an international organization which was established in 1969, which means we are celebrating our 50th birthday this year. And among its founders, very res our very respective, respectable founders were Supreme Court Justice Chaim Cohen of Israel, Arthur Goldberg of the United States, and Nobel Prize laureate and the father of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, René Cassin of France. So these human rights giants have left us an important legacy, um, a legacy that is reflected in the missions of the association, um, which comprise two main elements. The one, say maybe the, the heart of the work of the association, is to promote issues um, that uh, are relevant to Jews around the world, uh, fighting racism and uh, xenophobia in general, and more particularly, anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. But also our second mission, which is also very important, is to promote human rights uh, in general um, and to be the voice of Jewish lawyers and jurists on uh, human rights uh, violations uh, around the world. So throughout uh, the years, the association has been active and vocal on issues uh, and cases of grave violations relating to both these elements. Just uh, for example, in the recent years, we were involved in um, submitting an amicus brief to the Polish Constitutional Court with regard to the Polish uh, denial memory law, which deals also with Holocaust denial, of course. Um, but also at the same time, uh, the association uh, was actively vocal uh, on the issue of the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar, uh, expressing opposition before the Human Rights Council, where the uh, association has a status of a UN accredi accredited uh, NGO. So these are, again, our two uh, uh, aspects of activity. Uh, in the last couple of years, under the presidency of Advocate Mayor Linzen, who uh, for not, apologizes for not being able to be here, um, the association has been, uh, is going through some changes in the executive board. One of them is me, <laughs> one of the vice presidents, another vice president, and we are trying to expand. We are working on expanding our activities. Um, this also includes hiring Ido Rosenzweig, who is our director of international uh, organizations. Um, the idea is to um, be more active on both these issues, anti-Semitism and, and xenophobia, but also uh, on um, to pursue the adoption of a general thematic issue on human rights, uh, become experts, and uh, through this expertise try to promote um, the uh, human rights topic uh, uh, and uh, connect and uh, expand our uh, um, 
as far as much as we can uh, our impact uh, uh, in the human rights uh, community. So to this end, uh, we were thinking what would be uh, a good uh, topic in the, uh, at the initiative of uh, IDO. Uh, we decided to focus on the issue of uh, preventing sexual exploitation and abuse in the aid sector. Um, and it sounds maybe what is this to do with our association, but we think that this actually is a topic that is also, first of all, very important. And while it has been getting more uh, uh, traction and uh, being uh, dealt with in the uh, uh, and getting attention in the media because uh, of activists in the social media, the Aid Two movement, um, there is still much to do about it. It's still a little bit in the fringes of the international uh, concern. Um, so we believe that we maybe can promote uh, uh, and uh, uh, try to find a. a ways to deal and to find a, a, a way to go forward uh, with this very important topic. And we think that um, no one uh, is better equipped for this task than the people uh, in this room and the people <coughs> that will be uh, tomorrow in the conference. Um, when we look at this topic, the majority of the victims are uh, women, young girls, sometimes young boys, also a uh, uh, LGBT, LGBT uh, community. And many times these are minorities, foreign groups. So this is also linked to the issue of uh, the rights of minorities, xenophobia. Uh, it's also part of the problem. Um, our goal, and here I relate to what Ellie said, is not to work on an academic research. We are also a practically motivated the association, and uh, we want to help in finding a practical solution. And we understand that to do that, it is crucial that this process um, has to be done uh, in cooperation with the aid sector and not in a way that will hinder its operations. So we understand that we have to be linked to those doing the work and try to see how we can figure out a solution together with uh, those doing the, wor the work on the ground. Um, the idea, uh, so the idea is to promote it in a few ways. The first one is this event together with the Minerva Center and the Israeli School of Humanitarian Action. Uh, we, we, we are planning to go on to the UN and hold two more events on this uh, topic, one in Geneva um, and in the Human Rights Council uh, during the Human Rights Council session, and one in, the, uh, in New York uh, during the General Assembly session. So two more uh, events, uh, but this one will be uh, the basis where we, are, we will learn, we will hear, and we will come and we will try to form some kind of a, a, um, suggestions uh, towards uh, these events too. So I would like to thank me, our partners to this conference, the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law Under Extreme Conditions, uh, Professor Eli Salzberger, Dr. Michal Bengal, and um, uh, Mr. Eran Beta Lachmi, and uh, the Israeli uh, School of Humanitarian Action, especially the founding director, director will just follow me now, Mr. Enav Levy. And finally, again, Ido, thank you, the driving force behind this conference. Um, and I wish us all an interesting and fruitful conference. No, I, I, I yes, enter, yes, yes, I, you know, I, I came to this conference with, uh, with a tie, now I take his belt, it's tomorrow I come with my swimming suit. Uh, well, well, here's the thing, one of the positive things of being an Israeli is the fact that you can be informal, right, and you'll be forgiven. So it's people almost expecting you to come to your own wedding with flip-flops. Um, not, not really, don't go. Um, before I start, um, I want to tell you something. You, uh, only between two of us, so no one. You know, I was, um, for the last time in a few months that we were working together, I was thinking maybe, it's not thinking, right? Think, I, I, I felt that it's not, it's not about thinking. Thinking is, is, is not the right term I was looking to use when I was thinking about you. And I was thinking of and feeling a, a respect, a okay. Admir admiration, uh, um, I adore the, 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 the way you led, you are leading this vision, this vision that 
it's coming through also through this this conference. So I I envy you. Envy envy. It's a positive term, right? I envy you. I, I'm not sure. You know. I envy you and and really feeling uh, honored uh, um, to be able to call you Achi, my brother. So. I really, it's, uh, I would hug you in a different way. <laughs> so, um, you're also here. Um, <coughs> the humanitarian sector is in perpetual struggle. We are fighting. We are fighting through self-justification uh, um, with external powers who argue that we are enabling and encouraging dependence. We fight. I think we fight against policies, politics, uh, 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 budgets, agendas, uh, as the same that we saw just a couple of weeks ago uh, on the discussion of the UN resolution about uh, uh, um, recognizing uh, sexual abuse when it comes to conflict zone, right? We are also challenged, I think, from internal processes within our own sector arising from self-criticism on the quality and relevance of the response we provide. We're also fighting for the need and the will to become more professional and to benefit others. And we are also fighting for the will and the need to continue asking ourselves questions on ideas which once we more or less agreed upon and now I think we need to revisit again and again. We fight against good people who continue to uh, treat our profession as uh, one uh, devoid of commitment and best practices with no clear terminology as if, and against those from within our own sector who are comfortable with humanitarian action being perceived as one which requires no commitment. Well, there is always be critics. Which leads me to the next point. What are the humanitarian principles in a reality which may be different human rights against one another. So for instance, we can have the human rights, uh, uh, human rights for privacy, right? And on the other hand, we are dealing with technologies on, on data collection that on one hand can harm the actual privacy, the human rights privacy, but on the other hand, these same technologies allowing us better to apply and implement these same rights. And in the face of all of this, I think we must continue to look for tools, not only for justification. We need tools which will allow us to improve and optimize our efforts, to be better in what we are doing, whatever it will be. And, and on that sense, it's, uh, I was about to say I have a dream, but it's not a dream, right? I'm not still not Martin Luther King Jr. But I have this idea. Maybe you'll be angry with me. But the day uh, uh, that an aid worker will be sued, right? That will be the day where we can say to ourselves, there, we've done something. We have this validated professional toolkit. We are committed, not just a, a, on internal voluntary basis, but we are committed also by our partners on the field the people we are working with and for, then we'll know we'll have a proper profession conceived not only by us. So we've put together a law, uh, which sometimes you know, I regret to say, and then uh, um, 
oftentimes reflect as if only the, the, uh, uh, the lower end or the, uh, the starting point. And then, should we, I don't know, try or strive to change or adjust the law so it reflect universal values, other universal values? I don't know. I don't think. There's this question. Tomorrow we'll have a discussion in one, in one of our round tables exactly on that. And if so, how should we do it? And what I can say, this is only from my point of view, is that laws, at least when it comes to a humanitarian action, maybe should reflect the values we fight for. Values of dignity, of dignity. Dignity, of course, our dignity, but first and foremost, the dignity of the partners or the people that we are all working for in the field. And in that sense, dignity maybe can be conceived as universal value in a way that it's worthwhile to fight for and to win this struggle we are facing. Thank you.